Uh, how's it going, everyone? Good afternoon. Uh, it's one o'clock now, and um, we will maybe wait another minute or two for folks to show up, and then we'll get started here. Thanks for joining us today. So we'll wait to 102 here. Okay, well, I think we'll get started here. Uh, afternoon, everybody. My name is Casey Gish. I'm here with PNCWA. Uh, thank you for joining the first of um, what will be about nine or 10 continuing education presentations where we work with um, manufacturers and vendors to uh, discuss a technical topic related to water and wastewater treatment, um, and CEUs will be awarded. Uh, Me Green, uh, PNCWA's partner in hosting these presentations, will follow up tomorrow with CEU certificates to each attendee. A reminder that you must attend for the full hour uh, to receive the CEU certificate. We will be watching attendance and taking attendance at the beginning and the end of the presentation to ensure you are here for the full hour. Um, if you have any issues with the CEUs following the presentation, you're welcome to contact me um, or contact Meet Green directly and we can work with you to make sure um, you get the information you need. So uh, today we have a presentation uh, from UGSI Polymer Feed and our presenter is Jeff Rhodes, who is the Vice President of Commercial Development with UGSI. Um, he is a technical specialist in chemical feed applications for the United States. And he maintains over 30 years of experience in chemical feed analysis and control for wastewater treatment processes. Jeff earned his industry experience serving in municipal in, in, industrial, excuse me, and agricultural markets. And Jeff is the co-inventor of three patents in the area of disinfection control and polymer activation. So uh, at, with that, I think I will pass, the, uh, pass it to Jeff. Actually, one more point, I apologize, Jeff. Um, if folks have questions during the presentation, if you look to the bottom of your screen, there is a little box that says Q&A. Please click on that and type your questions in the chat box and I'll be monitoring that and can ask Jeff questions through the presentation. Um, otherwise, I think you could just chime in with questions. I believe you have access with your microphones. If you are, don't have anything to say, please keep your microphones off um, to limit background noise. Um, okay, with that, I will pass it to Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Casey. And good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate your attendance this afternoon. I'm gonna to try to make this uh, topic on polymer activation and the science and practice of uh, polymer activation as informative as possible for you. I'm gonna to try to uh, kind of take some of the mystery and complexity out of understanding polymer activation. And by in this presentation, uh, you will be an expert. And, and I think that's really the goal here today is to make uh, you feel more comfortable in understanding what are the important things to remember? What are the things that I need to understand about polymer activation? So I'm going to try to make it exciting for you as I can. Uh, sometimes I know when we talk about some technical equipment, it can be very boring, but I do have some videos that also help illustrate uh, and demonstrate some of the things I'll be talking about today. And I, that usually keeps people engaged. But uh, as Casey pointed out, if you have some questions along the way, please uh, bring them forward and we'll try to save some time here at the end as well. So uh, I really like to focus on the first few minutes on what's in it for you, because that's the most important thing here is what should you take away from this presentation? And it's really 
a couple of things. One is which is it's really understanding how to activate polymers. And you're gonna hear, hear me use that term a lot, is activate. You, know, you also hear hydrate. And really what it is, is just getting those polymer uh, particles to unwind and expose their charge sites. That's what the activation process is. And I'll get a little bit more on that in the coming slides. But it's really the science behind that. I mean, how do you design an activation system? So we're gonna talk about this two-stage mixing, which is really important and key to the proper activation of polymers. It's that high energy at the MOIW, which is an acronym for moment of initial wetting. And then residence time and this tapering of this energy is also an equally important. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then we're gonna start looking at some differences of mechanical systems versus hydraulic systems and when to use which one and then dry versus liquid polymer options considerations. And then time permitting, I have several case studies that we'll try to go through all of them if we can. If not, we'll truncate that a little bit and make sure we leave some time for some questions. Um, everything that I'm gonna to present today is coming out of that book right there by Dr. Yong Kim. He's probably be by far the most published author in our industry and that's the book right there if you can see it. Uh, sorry, I probably called it my screen. If you're interested in a copy of that book, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or uh, John Darch with Global Sampson and Associates. He's our representative up there in the Northwest. But uh, Dr. Kim has been uh, very active in the research and development of polymer activation systems. He has five patents. He's authored this book that I just showed you, a very prolific presenter of technical papers at the uh, WEF, as well as the residual and biosolids shows. Also, he is a committee member, a subcommittee member on a biosolids committee. Um, so they really work together with a lot of polymer suppliers, dewatering equipment suppliers, and really help the industry understand polymers, dewatering in general. So they did publish a fact sheet called Polymer and Flocculants 101, and you can certainly obtain that from uh, the WEF. So that's, I think that's important to point out because the second question after you, the first question is what's in it for you? The second question is what's, you know, how do, uh, what, how am I gonna be able to present this information or what gives me the uh, ability or the understanding to present that? And uh, this is all coming from Dr. Kim. So uh, all this information I'll be presenting today. Um, the other thing is to really kind of shape your mind on how important is this? And you'll see that uh, by just selecting the right polymers and the right polymer activation equipment, you can save a substantial amount of money. As you can see on the right, uh, 25 to 40% efficiency is uh, are almost very common to achieve with uh, polymer activations by doing it right. So those are the monetary side. So if you have a, let's say you're spending $100,000 a year on polymer and by doing it a little bit better, saving 25%, that's 250, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, uh, $25,000 a year in savings. So that's pretty significant. A lot of times that savings is enough to pay for the capital equipment itself. So therefore your return on investment is one year, which is virtually unheard of. But you're also gonna see as we go through this presentation, it's not always just the uh, polymer savings. Sometimes you get better process results, maybe a better cake solids. Uh, or maybe a better uh, flock on top of your filters if you're looking at it from a, a filtration aid or flock aid on top of your filters. But by doing so and making sure that you're activating those polymers efficiently, maybe you're reducing your backwash time, maybe you're getting a better removal rate, therefore you're getting a higher production through your filters. So there's those other uh, things to consider when you're looking at polymer activation uh, systems. It's not always, the, the money always helps justify the expense in terms of polymer savings, but a lot of times you get a lot of better process results and you'll see that as we go through this presentation. So kind of just a little basic understanding or what are polymers? Uh, they're a series of monomers held by carbon-carbon bonds. And that's what holds those together. And the higher the molecular weight of a polymer means the more these monomers are chained together to make this polymer. That's important to remember It's just because you hear molecular weight used a lot of times, and that's that length of the chain. Uh, there's different types of charge dense, uh, charges and charge densities. There's anionic polymers, there's cationic polymers, and there's non-ionic polymers. 
Uh, and then there's different types of delivery forms. Either it's a solution, which is generally a very low molecular weight polymer. Sometimes you really don't need an activation step. We call that dilute and shoot, just pump it in. Uh, but those are generally low molecular weights. Most of your liquid polymers are emulsions that you'll see these days. And then of course there's dries. Now your emulsions will vary in terms of active content. And that's gonna be something to, to remember. And I'll point that out as we go through here. I'll have a couple of slides with, with some emphasis on that. There's also, what I'm referring to here mostly is these uh, linear polymers. But there's also over the last couple of years, what we've referred as uh, um, what you call cross-linked polymers. And those are uh, behave a little bit differently and they react a little bit differently. So be mindful of when the polymer suppliers come in there, understand uh, more about what the polymer is, how it's the charge density, the active content, is it linear, is it chain, uh, a branched polymer? Those type of things are gonna be important to understand. And I'm gonna give you some helpful tips here as we go along to understand that. Um, so the, the, the goal here is to properly uh, unwind this chain. And that's what's illustrated with that red wind with the negative charge sites attract, attracting the positive charge sites. So it's that's what you're trying to do is accomplish is unwind that chain without damaging it. So think of it as like a ball of string. You've got this tightly wound ball of string and you're trying to roll that string out, expose those charge sites without damaging that chain. And the, as that chain unwinds and exposes its charge site, it gets fragile. That's why that two-stage energy is important and how you balance that energy and how much energy is applied initially and how you taper that energy. Otherwise, that ball of string, you damage it, it's like running over with a lawnmower. You're just gonna chop that chain all up and you really defeated the purpose of a, of a high molecular weight chain. Now, one of the, the advantages of a high molecular weight chain is you can attract more particles to it, right? So now you get a more heavier, uh, settable flock. So again, you know, it's, uh, I talk to my son a lot about what I do and, and uh, he's, he's sifted it all the way down. Well, you're basically doing liquid solid separation. I'm like, well, yeah, that's pretty much water and wastewater in a nutshell, but obviously everybody in this call knows there's more to it than that. But the whole idea is to accelerate that settling and that uh, flocculation. And that's what the advantages of high molecular weight polymers will do for you. Um, so let's kind of think about what this liquid polymer looks like. So probably the best way to relate to it is think of it as like vitamin capsule that perhaps you took this morning. You've got that little gel capsule that you take and it dissolves in your stomach and then all the good stuff comes out and gets in your body and makes you feel a whole lot better. So think of it as that way. And what we're trying to do with polymer activation is provide energy to break that shell open. And you can see that polymer particle right there. And you're trying to get this polymer particle to get exposed to the water. That's that moment of initial wetting you heard me talk about in the first or second slide there. And it starts that activation or hydration process. And then you'll start getting this, the, uh, the chains to unwind and start exposing their ch uh, charge sites. And you can see here across the bottom, this is the kind of the, the energy profile. You need high energy at first to get that polymer shell to, to come out, you know, break open that shell, get that polymer particle out of there, start the hydration process, and then taper that shear, start uh, decreasing that energy so that you don't damage that chain as it's starting to unwind and expose its charge sites. And then you're gonna to go to your point of application from there. Um, this is an illustration that kind of gives you an idea what you're trying to accomplish here. Here's the neat polymer uh, particle up in the upper left. And right below that is what happens if you don't provide enough energy at the moment of initial wetting, you're going to get what we call a fish, fish eyes. You probably have heard that commonly used in, in the industry. And that's just really a lot of agglomerated polymers. They started getting sticky, they stuck together, and you've got this fish eye. The problem with that is that fish eye, think of it as going on your belt press, it's eventually, if you get too many of those fish eyes, you're overdosing your polymer and you're gonna start blinding your belt, which then you're decreasing your belt filter press run times. You're not probably getting the centrate, or excuse, in this case, filtrate that you're looking for. So keep, keep in mind that that high energy is to prevent those agglomerations initially. And this is what you wanna achieve is this unwinding and uncoiling of those polymer chains to expose those charge sites. And as I mentioned earlier, if you keep exposing it to too much energy, you'll chop it up. So several of you might remember the days when we used to feed polymer through a tank and mixer. 
you just had a great big tank and a mixer with a prop in it and you poured polymer in there, you add water and you turned your mixer on and you were trying to avoid this, but you probably created it. You were trying to achieve this and most likely created that because you think about it, you ran that mixer for 30 or 40 minutes and all that solution did was loop around and go around that impeller and get chopped up and keep going back and around and continually damage it. That's why inline polymer activation systems are the way to do it these days. They try to uh, minimize any shear once that polymer has been activated. So here's an important term that you're going to want to remember is viscosity. That is the goal when you're activating polymers is to achieve the highest viscosity within a known concentration. That's the most important thing is that means you've been very efficient at activating it without having to overfeed polymer to achieve your process goals. And again, the, the higher viscosities accelerate the settling rate. Uh, this is a, a, a graph here that shows that. And again, this information's in that, uh, Dr. Yong Kim's book. If you'd like to get into a lot more detail, I think he has several pages dedicated to, to this with all the math that supports it, which I am not that good at that math. So um, this is the best way to explain it, Dr. Kim. And again, is it's the viscosity that you're trying to achieve. Now, there are instruments available. You can find them through uh, Brookfield, B-R-O-O-K-F-I-E-L-D, Brookfield viscometers, very useful tool. I would say that if your account uh, that you're spending $100,000 a year on polymer, it's well worth the investment to have a viscometer because you can check the neat polymer viscosity. That's the polymer that's delivered in that tote or that drum. You can check that to make sure it's consistent with the uh, product data sheet provided by the polymer supplier. But you can also check the viscosity, what we call emerging viscosity, which is this, uh, the viscosity of the solution after it comes out of these inline activation units. So it's a good way to really indicate, hey, am I getting consistent polymer from my polymer supplier? And how does this activation machine compare to maybe another uh, activation machine in terms of uh, efficiently activating the polymer? And the best way to measure that is through viscosity. So do look into the investment of a Brookfield viscometer I believe last time I checked, they were $1,800 to $2,200. So it's not an insignificant investment by any means, but it's a very worthwhile investment in terms of really understanding uh, if you're getting any variability from your polymer supplier or how one activation machine is performing over another. Um, here's an example of a polymer data sheet. This is from Salinas. They're one of the uh, largest uh, polymer suppliers in our industry, along with SNF. And this is the kind of information you'll see. And, and I know for some of us, this gets a little bit overwhelming to, to have the polymer folks come in and do their jar test and they're drying different things and they hold up a jar and they say, this one's the best one and it's a dollar a pound. Uh, so what you wanna do is really understand what the polymer supplier is doing and what information they're giving you. And it starts with this data sheet. So you can, you can tell that the, over here in the far left column, it's the, their product, the polymer product that they're promoting. You can see cationic charge. So that's important, low charge, low to medium charge and high charges. You can see active content. So that's important when you're evaluating one supplier versus another. The product viscosity here in the middle column, that's important. That's what it should be as it's delivered to you. And that's the basis right there. You wanna understand what that viscosity is and be able to make sure that's consistent with each shipment that you receive. Now the viscosity, once it's activated, are in these other two columns. You can notice that it, what the viscosity should be with a 1% solution and distilled water should be greater than, uh, that first one is greater than 5,000 centipoises. That's how you measure uh, viscosity. Or it's in a 1% or 1% solution in a 10% brine, it should be greater than 2,000 centipoises. Now what you're probably asking yourself, which is what I'd be asking is, well, I don't have distilled water at my plant and I sure don't have brine water at my plant. I have tap water with two parts per million chlorine residual. That's exactly right, or whatever your residual is. You should notify your polymer supplier and say, what should my viscosity, my solution viscosity be with my water quality? Here is my hardness, here is my chlorine residual, and uh, 
I want to know what it should be at a 1% solution or maybe even a half a percent solution. Now that becomes your goal that you want to meet or exceed that viscosity. So that's really important that you understand that because these two columns, while nice with data, really don't mean much to us out in the plants, right? We're not using distilled water or brine. So uh, keep that in mind as you go uh, start evaluating polymer suppliers. Um, here are some low hanging fruit. These are probably the questions I ask uh, almost immediately when I go out to a plant and the, the staff might be saying, hey, we're not, we don't seem to be getting the results we're looking for. And the, the, these are a couple of things that really are important because the, the quality of the dilution water that makes up the polymer is very important. Uh, hardness, when you get over 400 parts per million of hardness, uh, it really restricts the polymer particles ability to absorb the water, therefore activate the polymer. So you may need to consider a softener. That doesn't mean you need a softener, but you may consider, well, for the cost of a softener, uh, you know, keep in mind, most of these sizes are a 10 gallon a minute water feed rate. So that's really like a household softener. Um, how much more polymer savings can I achieve by softening my water? Uh, chlorine residual, probably the most important thing to really pay attention to in your water. Once you get over three parts per million of chlorine residual, you really, uh, your viscosity drops off substantially. And the reason is, is going back to what I first pointed out is those monomers that make up the polymers are held by these carbon-carbon bonds. And essentially what that chlorinated water is doing is dissolving those carbon-carbon bonds. So you're dissolving that solution. Uh, so that's why it's, when you get over three parts per million, you probably need to consider, can I reduce my chlorine residual? Some cases you may, some cases you may not. Or does it make sense to dechlorinate my water? Maybe, maybe not. Those are the things that we can help you kind of pencil whip it, if you will, to try to determine, hey, how much polymer can I save uh, if I uh, uh, dechlorinate or reduce my polymer? And uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, here's some, I don't have a slide on this, but here's some helpful hints too. So the more dilute your solution is, uh, so say for example, uh, you have a dry polymer feed system and you're making it down at 1% and you have chlorinated water of uh, two parts per million chlorine residual, that solution will last you probably uh, four days. You can use that solution for four days, as long as you're not exposing it to mixing, right? You've already got this made down solution. It's in a tank, you're feeding it to your point of application. Now, as you decrease the solution concentration, for example, now maybe you might be at a half a percent solution. Now your storage is really only good for about two days. Because again, it's that chlorine over time going to work on that solution. And then as you get lower than 0.5% uh, solution concentration, for example, maybe uh, 0.25, now you're, you probably should use it the same day. Because so the more dilute your solution with chlorinated water, the, the shorter the shelf life. So remember that. Uh, temperature is important. Uh, maybe not so much in the Northwest. Well, maybe today in the Northwest uh, with some snow I hear up there. But uh, you want to stay between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, not very often do we see chillers on the incoming water. In Arizona, we see that. But we do see occasionally uh, preheated water coming into some of the polymer. I, I live in Colorado, and we have quite a few installations where our water temperature is so low that we do need to preheat it just to be able to uh, get better activation. Suspended solids and pH. Really not a big issue in our in the municipal market, but can be in the industrial markets. So for those of you that might be into industrial applications, uh, keep that in mind as well. So, you know, just kind of recapping, it's that moment of initial wetting where you need that high energy. We're going to quantify that here for you in just a minute, followed by a low energy zone or quiescent zone to allow those polymer particles to unwind and expose their charge sites. If you need that residence time to achieve that. And then you have a fully activated polymer solution to your, uh, at your desired concentration. Now, how did we get into these inline mixing systems? This started, oh, 35 years ago. And Dr. Kim was very instrumental in helping a particular polymer company called Nalco uh, up in the Chicago area understand this. So this was the first inline mixer that was developed. It was a single stage, meaning it ran at one speed and had just one uh, chamber in there. And at 1700 is the G value that was quantified. So uh, Dr. Kim 
uh, like everything else in our business, especially water treatment, we'd like to look at GVIs when we look at flash mixers and things of that nature. And you can think of this as a very similar, just a very small scale, but that G value and that single stage mixing, uh, Dr. Kim was able to, to investigate further and determine that two stage mixing was able to achieve even better results. And even with higher energy, you can see down here, there's a sl very uh, slight uh, view of a, a baffle, a clear acrylic baffle that's slotted and your incoming polymer water react here at a now at a 4,000 G value, and then flows through to this low energy zone where there's no impeller spinning in here. It's just a, a volume, again, that resonance time and allows the energy to dissipate and, and leave the mix chamber. Now, here was the benefit of going from single stage to two stage mixing, just understanding that energy profile, was able to get a 22% increase in viscosity with a cationic polymer and a 37% increase in viscosity with an anionic polymer. Again, viscosity being the goal, the higher the viscosity you achieve, the less polymer you use, the better process results you will achieve. So that was a pretty important finding. And as you'll see, as we go through this presentation, you'll see uh, coming up how much more energy now is applied to today's polymers. But this is a, a video I'd like to show you that kind of gives you a better idea of what's really going on in these mixed chambers. This is your water inlet. You can see it comes straight in and feeds the eye of the impeller. Over here's a check valve. Right there is where the polymer is introduced. So water, polymer, and you have this high energy field right here with your impeller. And then you have your baffle that is slotted to allow this from the high energy zone to travel into the low energy zone. And then out this hole in the upper left is the discharge of solution. Now this video is, is gonna really help you understand what's going on. We're not feeding polymer in this video because if we did, it would just turn that mixed chamber milk white and you wouldn't really be able to see the differences. But what we did here is aspirate some air. So you get an idea of the mixing intensity in each one of those energy zones. So you can see the water flowing in here. You see the high energy created by this impeller. You see that with the agitation over here in this high energy zone, which now is 14,700 G value for today's polymers very high energy because today's polymers are very high molecular weight and it travels through that slotted baffle into this low energy zone where you can see if the energy is tapered you don't have that much mixing intensity over here and then out the solution outlet there so that's a uh, kevin gives you an idea what's really going on in this uh that environment so this two-stage mixing is not a new concept for everybody it's embraced by the polymer suppliers as well you can see, uh, you probably have experienced yourself when they come to your plant, they will uh, do those jar tests and they'll put the polymer in there, turn the, the paddle wheels up full blast, uh, maximum RPM to kind of create that high energy for a few seconds, 30 seconds maybe, or 10 seconds. And then they'll turn it down and let it kind of slowly react. And then you can watch the flock uh, start to appear and the liquid solid separation. And, and then the uh, They'll start going through some numbers, looking at active content and try to get an idea of dosing. So that's what's really happening here is we're, we're all doing the same thing. And uh, you could also see in this here, right here, the polymer can be available systems of inline mechanical mixing systems. So that's um, an endorsement, I would say, from the polymer suppliers to, about inline systems. They also come in non-mechanical, which we're going to get into a little bit as well. So Kind of thinking about the results, um, there's a lot of studies, not only by Dr. Kim, but also various uh, consulting engineering firms and other large utilities out there that are looking to understand this a lot better. And uh, there was a test performed uh, with single stage, two stage and three stage mixing uh, by uh, Jacobs Engineering, a gentleman by the name of David Yerke. And he did this out in Gwinnett County in Georgia and determined that two stage mixing offered the best uh, environment for uh, optimizing the polymer activation. And in this example, um, we did side by side for about a month and uh, it was projected that two stage mixing was gonna provide a savings of about annual savings of about $200,000 a year. So that's the important thing. You know, There's very few things in our industry that the capital cost is so much lower than what the benefit that, that equipment brings and polymer activation is one of them. The polymer costs a lot of money. And if you do it right, you can save a lot of money. And it's the investment in the equipment is virtually, it's, I would say insignificant, but not as important as your choice of equipment. You know, Make sure you have this two-stage mixing 
to achieve and optimize your results. Um, another uh, important thing is dilution. Uh, we, we found that uh, having the ability to do two-stage dilution is important as well. And we've, we've offered that uh, as a standard, in some cases, even on our, on our act mechanical activation systems, it's a standard. And on our hydraulic op uh, activation systems, it's an option. So what does it really do? You know, I think the important thing here is when you're dealing with emulsion polymers, that if you put all the water up front, you're diluting those surfactants that aid in the activation of the polymer. So that's why you'll see a two-stage dilution. Typically, you want to make the uh, polymer down at a 1% concentration. So the polymer in that mixed chamber uh, video was about 1%. And then as it exits the mixed chamber, you dilute it down to a half a percent or a quarter percent, whatever desired concentration. Interestingly enough, that is an AWWA standard, AWWA B453-6. So, uh, and again, sometimes that's really helpful, but it depends on your polymer. Uh, we found that some of these uh, cross-linked or uh, type polymers uh, perform better with uh, less resonance time and uh, not the benefit of two-stage uh, dilution. But if you have two-stage dilution, you have the option to use it or not use it. That's the, probably the benefit there is if I change polymers, does this new polymer require the two-stage dilution to perform better? and activate better or not. And that having the, that ability is the important thing to give you the versatility out there in the field. Um, residence time, you've heard me talk about that a couple of times. That is important. That's one thing that Dr. Kim uh, really emphasized over the last few years is the residence time. How much residence time? You'd be surprised it's in seconds. It's not minutes, uh, but it's in seconds that helps aid that uh, unwinding, gives it, gives it a time to do its job before you take it to the point of application or expose it to any type of pumping, like a progressive cavity pump, feeding a solution. Uh, you may, may go into a, a, a tank. Uh, now we talk about these inline systems. Sometimes they go into a tank and then maybe have multiple points of application from there. The key is do not put a mixer in that tank once that polymer has been activated. But uh, you know the residence time is important, but the longer the residence time, uh, the more fragile the polymer can be. So I'm not going to beat you to death with equipment pictures. I'm just going to really focus on the mixed chamber itself because everything else is pipe valve fittings and controls, right? So let's focus on those mixed chambers and, and the importance of those. So let's kind of compare here the mechanical mixed chamber versus the hydraulic mixed chamber. The mechanical mixed chamber, those, the pictures that I was showing you earlier in that video that I showed also is... You know, obviously easier to quantify. You can quantify that energy and that's important because now it's something that you can say, look, I want this amount of energy. I want 14,000 G value initially. I want to taper that energy. I want to get those results. Uh, so that's important that you can do that with hydraulic. Obviously, since there's no motor, you can't really quantify a G value. So we have to look at force or magnitude of force uh, with the where the polymer and the water, the dilution water come together or where those two flows uh, impinge. And the, at a uh, 90 degree angle, you get more force, right? With that, uh, to, uh, those two flow streams impinging on each other, than you do if it's tangential. And that's important uh, to remember because you know, it's that force that's creating that high energy to help break that polymer uh, shell open, get that polymer particle out of that shell, begin the hydration process. So that's something to remember. Again, it's that two-stage mixing, high energy followed by low energy. But when you're mechanical, you're quantifying that by G value. When you're hydraulic, you're quantifying it by magnitude of force and angle. So keep that in mind. Uh, I'll just show you a kind of an idea. The far left here is a hydraulic activation system. And I'll show you a cutaway in a minute of this mixed chamber. That is a mechanical activation. That was the video that we showed right there. Like I pointed out earlier, everything else is pipe valve fitting and controls. So the important thing is understanding what's really going on in these mixed chambers to activate the polymer. And then here are some dry polymer feed system. This is a mechanical activation and, and above it is the uh, example of a jet wet head or a hydraulic activation system. Um, they, the good thing about these two products is they both incorporate those two energy fields, uh, the high energy followed by low energy and also the resonance time and volume. Uh, that video you recall that was a high energy followed by low energy and here it's the high energy is right here at that moment of initial wetting where those two uh, flow streams impinge at a 90 degree angle then you have the residence time in the low energy zone 
which is the, it's essentially, it's almost like a static mixer. It's a series of concentric rings that allow that energy to dissipate, allow those polymer chains to unwind and expose their charge sites. So there's a, a, a great example of two different types of activation system, one being mechanical and the other being hydraulic, but they both incorporate the science of polymer, which is two-stage mixing. Um, these are the things that kind of thought bubbles, if you will, that should go through your mind when you're thinking about which one I should select. Should I select the mechanical? Should I select the hydraulic? Because it really depends. I know we, we never like that as an answer when we ask somebody, which one should I use? And it's, it depends, uh, and response comes out. But to kind of give you some ideas, if you're in an explosion proof environment, uh, maybe you want the hydraulic mixing system. If you're concerned about savings on polymer activation and being able to operate from a wide variety of polymers, maybe the mechanical's better. If you're dealing with a bridged or branched polymer, uh, maybe the hydraulic would be better. So, um, you know, give us a call or, or give John Darch a call up there in the Northwest with Global Samson and kind of go through the thinking and say, here's my situation. Here's what I'm most concerned with. Uh, what what system would be best for me and we'll help you match them. And you should do that with all polymer equipment suppliers. Just make sure you really understand it. But as you can see, the first few slides I went through was really helping to understand the polymer and now polymer equipment. So you really, it's beneficial to you to understand both and those key terms, viscosity and two-stage mixing and, and resonance time. The, uh, as you can see here, again, I'm gonna kind of go quickly through some of these slides because it gets a little bit redundant on, on the equipment. But uh, the advantage of a hydraulic system, a two-stage hydraulic system, no moving parts, no, no motors to be concerned with, uh, low maintenance, uh, low operating cost, a very reliable uh, type system. So I would say if you have medium to uh, molecular weight polymers, this is a good choice. Uh, or if you even have a branch polymer, maybe this would be a good choice. So that's something to consider there. Uh, here's again, it's that uh, force of angle. Notice here that it's the velocity, that, that fluid velocity creates that force. So think about it as you put your thumb over that hose, you know, you're, you're creating this higher velocity stream and that's essentially what we're doing with the hydraulic systems is you're creating this high fluid velocity at 70 feet per second to create that magnitude of force uh, when it impinges with the polymer. Uh, so you can get variable, what they call uh, linear adjust actuated variable orifices to kind of change the amount of flow that's impacting here. And then you can see a better cutaway of the concentric rings that allow that solution to unwind in the secondary uh, energy zone there. Just another picture there uh, kind of shows you how that uh, travels and flows through. There's a variety of these different types of hydraulic mixer uh, chambers. Uh, the mechanical mixed chamber pretty straightforward. Some of you might not, uh, if you have a mechanical system, especially if it's an old polymer polyblend system, we've eliminated that uh, blue bearing frame uh, for a couple of reasons. One of which is to eliminate the concerns of trying to line the shafts, the motor shaft and this impeller shaft. So now you just slide the motor shaft in there, it's aligned automatically. There's a quick disconnect. So when you're looking at polymer equipment suppliers, I think that's a great benefit to have here for an operator and maintenance crew is to be able to get a quick disconnect off of that polymer check valve to, uh, to clean that periodically because it will get a little bit of residue buildup in there. And if it gets bad enough, you'll start getting water migrating back into your neat polymer, which can then create uh, some gumming and fouling. And then you, then you have to shut the system down and clean it. So uh, definitely periodically clean that. And we're trying to make that a lot easier. You can see this, uh, uh, extension, if you will, of the secondary zone. And I believe I got a slide coming up that's gonna show you that. But um, as I mentioned earlier, energy is really getting higher and higher. And I think we might be at the peak now of, of what amount of energy we need to introduce um, versus what the polymers are available on the market today. And as I mentioned, we're at 14,000. So that older paddle wheel design, here's where your energy was. Remember it was 1700. And then we did two stage, you can see that, a little step up to 4,000, now we're at 14,000. So we're much higher in the, uh, in the polymer uh, energy of the field there. The, um, you can see the difference in the mixed chambers. Again, this is something that Dr. Kim focused on was just increasing this volume here to get a little bit uh, more resonance time, therefore get a little bit more results. Um, interestingly enough, 
as you can see this lab test polymer solution viscosity increased by five to 10%. And uh, I got to tell you, I was not uh, really excited about that at first when I heard that. I was like, well, five or 10% really doesn't seem like a lot. I mean, if I had a five or 10% pay raise, that seems pretty good. But a 5%, 10% increase in viscosity doesn't really seem that great. And Dr. Kim assured me that when you take that increase in viscosity and apply it to uh, how much polymer consumption or the savings in polymer consumption, it was going to be compelling. And he was right. And I'm going to show you that here uh, coming up. But before we do that, get into those case histories, I want to briefly talk a little bit about uh, dry polymer feed systems. Very similar in their terms of their design. It's that two energy, uh, dual energy, high energy, followed by low energy. And this is the final feed skid. So this is your dry feeder, feeding your polymer into the mixer, a disperser. I have a, a close-up detail on that to show you. Um, this particular design has the ability to add an emulsion feed pump. So you could feed dry or an liquid emulsion polymer adder. And the reason is the energy uh, activation is very similar. This is actually 15,000 RPG uh, value on this mix chamber here. So it's a little bit more than the 14,700 that we generally use for liquid, but definitely um, uh, ideal. For example, if you're a utility that periodically bids out polymer and you're open to liquid as well as dry uh, to pro trials, you can use the same equipment. Uh, but be mindful of a couple things. Uh, one of which is uh, there'll be a, you'd have to change the screen here uh, and your controls to let it know you're going to an emulsion polymer. And then remember this, dry polymers are 100% active, emulsion polymers are about 40% active. So you need to be aware that you're gonna feed more volume of that solution because it's less active than you were with the dry, but it can be done and is done. We have quite a few installations with this liquid emulsion option. It's really ideal because it eliminates the need to have yet another piece of equipment that's designed for liquid emulsion and one that's dedicated to dry, which you can get uh, both of them through one piece of equipment. Uh, this is the jet wet head, which is the hydraulic mixing. I'm gonna get in a little bit of comparing both of these here in the coming slides. A little more detail on the mechanical dry polymer activation system. A plunger right here. This is more of a housekeeping to prevent when the, when the uh, system is not activated or uh, in a batch mode, it seals up against this uh, feeder spout and prevents any moisture from migrating and the ideas are to prevent these, what I would refer to as white beards that, that can accumulate because again, you're in a, a, a moisturous environment and it's gonna react with that dry polymer and it's gonna start activating. And you don't want that to fall in here and plug it up and cause any problems for you. Uh, water inlet, water outlet, and there's a side stream of water that creates a vortex to help direct the dry polymer down into the eye of the impeller where you're getting that, again, moment of initial wetting, high energy, prevent those agglomerations and you're transferring the solution to your uh, aging tanks from there. Uh, that can also be accomplished through a hydraulic means. And this has some benefits. Uh, so I'm gonna give you kind of help, some helpful tents, uh, tips here, but think about uh, this as a solution conveyance system. And when you start looking at a hydraulic system, you're, you're conveying the dry material pneumatically. You're, you're blowing the material from the dry screw feeder up into this jet wet head, which is located above the tanks. And as the dry material falls, it's getting exposed to uh, high velocity spray jets that help wet the polymer and keep it from agglomerating. And then uh, into the tank it goes. Now, some helpful things here to remember, uh, you can feed a lot more polymer with a hydraulic system than you can a solution or mechanical feed system. Uh, you can see here, capable of to 50 pounds a minute of dry polymer. So that's very large systems can be achieved with hydraulic. Also, you're not limited to a discharge head. This type of system here, since it's conveying solution, you're limited to about 30 feet of discharge head. So if you have an application that maybe you're making your polymer up and maybe going to, to uh, a, fl a floor up and maybe uh, 50, 60 feet over and exceeds that 30 feet of discharge head, the pneumatic is going to be the way to do it because you can definitely deal with a little bit more uh, design challenges, if you will, uh, with a with a hydraulically activated dry system. So keep keep that in mind as you uh, you're getting those little thought bubbles that go through your mind of which system do I need 
kind of think about that as an important uh, part of it is how far do I need to convey the solution? Can I do it with a solution or do I need to convey the dry material to the point of or to the tanks and then activate the dry material? Uh, here's an example of a, uh, a pneumatic or hydraulic activated system feeder, got a little heater and it's pneumatically conveying it right over to these jet wet heads right above these tanks. Uh, so that's an example of how do you see the uh, bulk bag frame and bulk bag that would sit right over the top of this uh, dry feeder. So that's uh, definitely a way to do it uh, if you're looking for that. Uh, we have a lot of these installations out around the country and uh, you've noticed that these tanks are square and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in the coming slides why that could be an advantage in your design considerations. So this is something we always hear and you need to be mindful of is you're gonna hear about dry polymers. We need 60 minutes of aging time. Uh, you, you hear that probably, this, this is pretty much a standard anymore that people come out with, but do you really need 60 minutes of aging time? Uh, this was a, a study that was formed up in Ontario, Canada. And if you activate the polymer uh, properly at that moment of initial wet and you're providing that high energy, providing agglomerations, starting the activation process, you can see you can get my with 30 minutes. So this is your viscosity here. And you can see that additional time does not yield any greater viscosity. So do you really need 60 minutes or more? Um, and if I can do it in 30 minutes, what does that mean? Well, that means you can probably do the smaller tanks, uh, therefore a smaller room. Uh, so ideally when you're considering maybe adding uh, uh, more capacity to your existing plant and well, geez, we don't have really have enough room to add, you know, all this more tankage and systems, you know, can we get by with a little smaller tanks? Maybe we want to run our concentrations up higher. You notice that this one's at 1%. Uh, we discussed the advantages of having a higher concentration, solution concentration in terms of storage and uh, aging. So, you know, you don't always need that 60 minutes or greater. But again, if you're up against some constraints there in terms of size of the room, then let's focus on how we can achieve your results in 30 minutes versus 60 minutes and still optimize your performance and fit the equipment in the room. So again, some things to think about. So the second stage of dry polymer mixing is important uh, because it's the impeller. You, you, need to, you need to mix this tank, keep it mixed uh, slowly while new polymer solutions coming in there so you get a good homogeneous solution, right? You don't want fresh polymer on top of it old polymer because you're gonna get variable with process results. So kind of revisiting here, uh, what's the optimal mixer diameter? And it goes back uh, decades. <laughs> so if you look at the one on the left there, the ideal mixing ratio back then was uh, diameter of the impeller relationship to the diameter of the tank is a 0.3 ratio. That's that D over D. Uh, over the years, we decided that the larger the diameter of the impeller, therefore a 0.5 ratio, you're getting a better, more uniform energy mix. You can see it's 300 to one here. You get 300 times more mixing energy at the impeller than you do at the surface of this tank. And now you're starting to see that little smooth out a little bit. Um, so what uh, Dr. Kim discovered over the years is increasing that diameter of that impeller is the, the way to really create more uniform energy. But you have one particular problem. It's called the Weisenberg effect. You have to be mindful of that. Since polymer solutions are non-Newtonian pseudoplastic, and by the way, I didn't know that until Dr. Kim told me that years ago. It's not something I can re re relate or remember to, but uh, you can see that the when you, what, what that really results in is that solutions becomes more viscous and thick. Think of it as like a, a molasses, and it's gonna wanna climb up that shaft, and you're really not creating any mixing, right? You have very high mixing at the impeller, probably damaging the uh, polymer chain at that point and very low mixing energy at the upper and lower levels of the tank. And that's because of the phenomenon of this uh, solution being non-Newtonian pseudoplastic. So the goal is, is, geez, I really wanna keep my mixer diameter as great as I can, but I don't want this Weisenberg effect. How do I get around that? It's quite simple. Is, uh, as you can see here, Dr. Kim came up with this uh, 0.7 ratio what was unique, and by the way, not patented, this is just a best practice, so anybody can do that. Uh, any polymer supplier, polymer equipment manufacturer can provide this, is the polymer solution comes in here, instead of spilling on top of the contents of the tank, the flow is directed 
and it goes right in between this uh, uh, clear PVC sleeve and the mixer shaft right there. I have another detail coming up I'll show you. And this is called a hollow wing impeller. So the polymer solution now, instead of just being introduced in the top of the tank, is being introduced between the sleeve and the shaft. So you're not exposing this mixer uh, shaft to the entire contents of the solution in the tank. Therefore, you're avoiding that uh, Weisenberg effect. And then the solution comes out, these hollow wings, think of that as just like a channel. So it's uh, one and a half inch by eight inches. And now the polymer's in the bottom of the tank and you're able to get better mixing. And also the square tank helps create that mixing and that turnover. So you don't need the need of baffles and those things. So a very uh, keen idea that is not patented, as I mentioned, it's just a good practice and really beneficial uh, for everybody out there. So you can see here, uh, here's a 0.75% solution. You can see the clearly a vortex versus the Weisenberg effect. There's that PVC sleeve and the shaft, the mixer shaft. And now this video I'm gonna show you is gonna show how well of a job we can activate. This is a 0.65% solution concentration, but I'm also gonna show you where that polymer is introduced, that solution as we go through, but you can see this polymer just rolling in the corners here. A nice vortex, but right there, you see that pipe? That's where the new polymer solution is coming in. There's your mixer shaft. There's your clear PVC sleeve. So as you can tell, we're just not introducing it right here in the top of the tank. We're introducing it between these two items and all the way down and coming out the bottom of that hollow wing mixer. That is tremendous in terms of keeping your polymer system or polymer solution homogeneous. Again, the, the more things you can hold constant, uh, the less uh, trouble you'll have. So you always want to deliver a constant quality of polymer solution to your point of application. And that is the benefit with this type of design with a dry polymer feed system. So again, you can see the, uh, the uh, good rolling action there in the corners. And then you're not creating that Weisenberg effect. Clearly got a vortex here and that's uh, definitely the way to do it here. So I'm gonna move a little bit quicker. Some of this is just kind of an ideas on sizes because I wanna get into a couple of project examples before we open it up for some questions here. Um, Gwinnett County was a, uh, that was the one I was referring to earlier about the evaluating single stage deals, two stage and three stage. And it was determined that two stage was gonna uh, provide the greatest savings and production of polymer. You can see what the current spend is. So they are spending, 1.2 million annually based on thickening and dewatering. Uh, they evaluated single stage, two stage and three stage mixing uh, equipment. Uh, there was a variety of different test criteria here. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through the details, but I will uh, also, if anybody's interested in a PDF copy of this presentation, please uh, get in contact with me and I'd be happy to provide that to you so you can, it's a good resource to go back and, you know, what that fellow say again about the polymer and what do you say about this and so something you can have and, and refer to and I'd be happy to provide that for you but the wind up here is you can see the two stage uh, definitely performed a lot better you can see the polymer dose was a lot lower than a, than a, a single stage or three stage mixing and then again there's those other things that matter is the the, the filtrator centrate uh, you know, those type of things are important as well. Your cake solids obviously are important process goals. So again, you go back to these thought bubbles, what's the most important uh, uh, considerations? You don't have to pick one, you can pick multiple. Uh, and that's the kind of things. And you might have some other thought bubbles that you might think about that say, well, here's what's important to me and I didn't see that up there. And then please bring that to our attention and we'll help you get an idea of uh, which equipment is best for you. Um, I'm gonna go into another one here. This is, uh, let's go to this one in the Chamonix, uh, Pennsylvania. So this is a liquid polymer feed system. And this really kind of emphasizes the importance that uh, increasing residence time, it really also increases the importance of, remember I mentioned that uh, Dr. Kim said we had a five or 10% increase in viscosity and I was underwhelmed by that, but this is what the end result was. So this is a, uh, a location where they have two identical belt presses and uh, obviously it's the same sludge. And so the, the benefit here was they had one of our older mixed chamber designs. So it's a smaller one, doesn't have the residence time in there. And so we said, can we dedicate this one machine to one belt press? And can we put this new mixed chamber in here and dedicate it to the other belt press? 
and compare those results because we re we saw in the lab a five to ten percent increase in viscosity by this uh, increase in that volume in that mix chamber, and so they agreed to it. And here were the results. So I remember people laughing about a five or ten percent increase, but look what the polymer savings did. So that little bit of viscosity increase, again viscosity being the goal, equated to a thirty to thirty-five percent polymer savings. And you can see the performance being mirrored here between the 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 larger mix chamber in red and the smaller mix chamber in blue. So they mirrored each other over time, but you can see the dose was less. So that's the real benefit of uh, Dr. Kim brings is understanding that. So your mind is probably going where my mind was, was, well, can we make it even bigger yet? You know, let's make this thing three feet long. And, and, and uh, Dr. Kim was very patient with me because I get excited about these type of things and think, well, if one is good, 10 is better, right? And uh, he said, well, there's a point of diminishing returns. So what he decided and figured out was he optimized the length of that mixed chamber, the amount of residence time in that mixed chamber, the amount of energy in that mixed chamber. And at this point in time, with the polymers that are on the market, he's very comfortable that that's going to give us the best results without getting, those, getting to the point where you're getting to diminishing returns. So that's the real benefit of uh, having uh, Dr. Kim really understanding uh, these polymers and, and how they activate in these machines. But uh, uh, last but not least, I'm going to open up some questions here because we're bumping up against the end of the session here. But uh, as I pointed out earlier, it's not always polymer savings. That's the most important thing. Uh, look at they were able to get more throughput through the that belt, uh, belt those two belt presses. So that could be important. Maybe that uh, post postpones the investment into another belt press. Maybe that gives you more time to plan and save and design around a new piece of dewatering equipment that so essentially buys you more time. Maybe it's a better cake solids. So you can see here, we got a little bit better cake solids, closer to 23 versus 22. So 1%, is that important? Well, I can tell you in where I live uh, in Colorado, we have uh, Denver, I believe it was the years ago, told me that every 1% increase in cake was about $100,000 a year in hauling costs, savings. So some again, sometimes it's like, hey, I'm willing to pay a little bit more in polymer. Can you get me a drier cake? Because I have to haul this. Uh, the Denver Metro's case, I think it's about 110 miles. Uh, they're hauling that sludge. And I know there's some uh, uh, utilities up in the Northwest that haul their sludge quite a distance. So again, it's not always polymer savings is the most important thing. It always helps justify the expense, uh, but can I get better process results? Can I get more throughput? Can I get a drier cake? Can I get better uh, uh, filter run times? Can I get better run times off my belt press? without having to wash it down. So those are the important things to consider. So again, the takeaways here is that the two energy mixing, you can get that available in a mechanical or hydraulic systems on today's markets. Um, residence time is important, need to have that. And then when you get into some of these uh, site specific things and different types of polymer, uh, please get us involved uh, along with our uh, rep, John Darch with Global Samson. And we're happy to talk through your water quality, your plant uh, limitations if you have limitations in terms of space but uh, we're definitely available to assist you in optimizing and uh, getting the best performance you can with your polymers and your polymer activation equipment so with that i'd like to open it up to any questions all right thank you so much jeff awesome presentation very in information dense but uh really well delivered so if you do have any questions please pop them in the question and answers chat box uh we did have one question as to whether these presentations are gonna be made available to attendees? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the long answer is we're not sure exactly where they're gonna be posted yet, but um, we will follow up with an email communication on uh, reporting where those will be available. Um, so that was one question. Uh, another housekeeping item. Uh, there are two attendees who are calling in, I assume for the audio. Um, one from Tacoma, I see a 253 area code, and maybe one from Northwestern Oregon, I see a 971 area code. If those two folks can please email myself, um, cgish at uh, brwncalledcald.com, and kate at meetgreen.com, um, we want to, uh, we need to identify who you are so we can send you the CEU. Uh, registrations. My contact information is on the PNCWA website also. Um, so uh, are there any questions for 
uh, for Jeff. Um, so we had uh, Richard Fingers requested a copy of Dr. Kim's document. Uh -huh. um, the book. The book. That's handy dandy book. All right. That's the great resource. So yeah, just send me your information and we'll make arrangements to get you a copy. So what we're gonna do following up from this presentation is Meet Green is gonna send out uh, Jeff's contact information. So um, please do contact him with follow-up questions. And then um, Richard, you could probably reach out to him directly if that's okay, Jeff, um, sure. to get you a copy of, of the, Polymer, the Polymer book. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Usually when I'm in person, uh, I've presented uh, with the uh, PNCWA several years in a row now. And uh, I usually bring one book and give it to the person and ask the most questions. So, <laughs> so, appreciate, every the <laughs> right. so appreciate everybody's uh, attendance and uh, participation today. I really uh, appreciate the time to speak in front of you and uh, looking forward to working with you in the future. We had one more quick question come through, sure. uh, Jeff. Uh, can you talk about polymer activation with regards to DAF thickening? Um, yeah, I mean, there's quite a few applications with DAF thickening. In fact, up in the Northwest, there's quite a few applications with DAF thickening. And um, it's really the same as it would be for dewatering uh, or even mechanical thickening, like on a, on a, on a, a, a thickening. Uh, but so, um, you know, there's nothing unusual about that application. Your dosage may be different. Um, and that's something I could point out. I've talked to Casey about this before we got started today. Um, we have a sizing tool on our website. It's uh, the uh, ugsichemicalfeed.com and you'll see a polymer sizing tool. And on that tool, you can select DAF, dissolved air flotation thickening. And then it's gonna give you a series of drop down menus that you can select based on your particular process, your flow, uh, the solution desired concentration you want to achieve and it'll help you select an equipment, uh, a sizing for that. But there's really not a whole lot of differences with a DAF as there would be with any other type of thickening device. Um, you, see, you know, uh, your concentrations might change a little bit. Seems like, um, you know, maybe they're a 0.3% with other thickening, 0.3% uh, solution concentration. And with other thickening devices, you might see a little bit higher or a concentration of 0.5. But generally, it's the same thing. And if you need some help with uh, with that, uh, please again, don't hesitate to contact me and I'll be glad to help you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, you looks like there aren't any other questions. Uh, so again, we'll look for an email tomorrow morning with the CU certification um, and Jeff's contact information. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to him if there's further questions or um, you wanna dig in more to Polymer. Okay, thank so, you very much, you Casey. Yep, thank yeah, you, thank you, Casey. Thank you for your time. You bet. Thank everybody out there and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. One last uh, announcement. We have an upcoming presentations on March uh, 3rd, 17th and 31st and then additional presentations in April and May. So um, if folks want to continue to take advantage of the CEUs through PNCWA, please, uh, please register for upcoming presentations. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you.